Well, hello and welcome back. If you're wondering what a ski jacket and pants are doing on a mountain bike channel, don't panic. There are a few reasons for it. First and foremost, a lot of the details that I'm going to discuss here with regards to uh, general jacket and pant construction, so face fabrics, waterproof breathable membranes, and liner fabrics, as well as uh, features in general construction, are all going to apply to mountain bike jackets, which, in my experience, are a bit difficult sometimes to understand what you're looking at. Uh, I think waterproof breathables in the mountain bike space is still new and there isn't enough information out there for consumers to make wise decisions. And I hope that this video will help inform you so that when you're looking at your next um, uh, waterproof breathable for mountain biking, then all of this information is going to be directly applicable. So secondly, there is kind of the business aspect of it. I love making mountain bike content and that is 100% the future of this channel. However, I have to acknowledge that in the last 30 days, my mountain bike videos haven't even broken the top six in terms of my most watched videos. So since YouTube requires 6,000 watch hours and 1,000 subscribers before I earn a single penny from any of my efforts, I have to acknowledge the fact that right now it seems that ski touring and skiing content is quite popular given the seasonality. So if I have to upload, say, the occasional ski jacket and pant video, I hope you forgive me for it, but I'm just trying to build this channel up so that I can keep going down that mountain bike direction. Lastly, I kind of have a suspicion that a lot of mountain bikers tend to do backcountry ski touring in the winter anyways. And this is not a shameless plot just to get you to comment, but for my subscribers particularly, if you were to let me know in the comments down below, if you also ski tour and would like to see more ski touring content, I was thinking maybe what I might do is, well, this is gonna be a main Sunday video. I might do some say Wednesday, Thursday videos on different ski touring uh, content. So if that's something you'd like to see, please let me know and I will move forward with that. If it's not something you want to see, on a mountain bike channel, I totally get that. And I'm still gonna make those videos, but I'll just upload them in another place. So I wanted to take this video as an opportunity to sort of gauge interest. Now, if you are probably the majority audience here who has clicked on this video because you just want information on this jacket and pants, here we go. So in Arcteryx winter lineup, there are essentially two jacket and pants series, the Rush and the Sabre, which is what these are. Now, they both do use very similar fabrics, being the N80. 80, referring to 80 denier, which is a durability rating. So you can easily think about it in terms of the higher that rating, the thicker that fabric is going to be. The N simply referring to nylon. And this is where we're sort of going to start our conversation about general jacket and pant construction. So taking a big step back, we have things like 2.5 layer and three layer construction garments. And what those are referring to is the first layer being your face fabric. So in this case, that N80D. The middle uh, layer, which is actually going to be your waterproof breathable membrane. So in this case, we're using a PTFE membrane being the Gore-Tex membrane. And then there's going to be an inner fabric or an inner backer. Now, 2.5 and three layer are very similar in the sense that 2.5, it just, instead of using a fabric third layer, it uses a spray on, um, usually it's like a grid on the back of the actual raw, um, waterproof breathable membrane. And that's just to create a little bit of standoff so that your skin isn't directly in contact with that waterproof breathable membrane. Whereas a th uh, three layer is going to use an actual fabric. Now unique to the uh, Sabre series is they're actually using a brushed backer. So if you read through the specs, it seems a bit confusing because they call it a non-insulated and an insulated. That brushed backer is the insulation, but it's not insulation that you're used to in terms of either a synthetic or a down. When we talk about mountain bike jackets, the exact same thing applies. So whether that's a 2.5 or a three layer, the third layer arguably are better because all the dirt and the oils that are going to be on your body don't directly transfer and make contact and clog the pores of that waterproof breathable membrane. 
Now, of course, there are many different types of waterproof breathable membranes. As mentioned, this is using Gore-Tex, which is a expanded PTFE product. Uh, think about it like Teflon, although Teflon's a, a trade name. And basically it's a, um, a layer with very, very small holes. Other companies achieve uh, their waterproof breathable membranes by using very tightly woven fabrics. So there's different ways to sort of achieve the same end result. With regards to mountain bike garments, the exact same thing applies, but what we see significantly less in the mountain bike world are brands like Gore-Tex or other waterproof breathable known membrane manufacturers. And even less common do we see waterproof breathable ratings on those garments. And that's actually what's so important and why I'm gonna actually put the tag at the end of this video as part of my backcountry safety series because if you're going into the backcountry, whether that's just on a day trip or even a multi-day bikepacking journey, then those numbers are gonna be really important based on your physical exertion. So generally speaking, Gore-Tex and Gore-Tex Pro, which is used in the Rush, tend to have about 20,000 millimeters of water column or waterproof rating and about 20,000 grams per meter squared in terms of the breathability rating. How they get that is they literally fill a water cylinder and they put that on the actual face fabric of the garment. And the more pressure that garment can withstand, the higher that waterproof rating is. So generally speaking, it's, it's a garment is not considered waterproof for anything less than 1000 millimeters. So you get a thousand just for showing up and calling yourself waterproof. Back in the day, we used to have uh, jackets that used like a spray and crack uh, coating system to achieve waterproof breathability. And those are sitting in and around like the 3000 and 5000 respectively. Gore-Tex, as mentioned, is using around 20,000 and there are some companies claiming 30,000, but I think there's a big asterisk associated with that. And even in the ski jacket and pants where those ratings are much more commonplace, unfortunately that's where the marketing departments tend to kick in. Now what we have seen sometimes is the marketing department celebrating the fact that that waterproof breathable membrane, that middle layer, is capable of performing up to a certain standard. For example, 20,000, 20,000. However, what we're actually seeing in the ski industry is a lot of manufacturers backing away from publishing those figures because the actual face fabric, the, the thickness and weight of that face fabric and the thickness and weight of that inner fabric or liner or backer actually impact the breathability rating. And so you might end up buying a garment thinking it has 10,000, 10,000 or 20,000, 20,000. And actually in theory, something rated at 10,000 could outperform 20,000. You might be, well, how is that the case? Well, if the one that has that 10,000 breathable membrane, but is using an impossibly thin face fabric and uh, just, you know, like a printed on back, backer fabric, like you'd see on a Gore-Tex Pro garment, well, that's gonna breathe exceptionally well, as opposed to say something that has a 20,000 breathable inner uh, waterproof breathable membrane, but a very thick face fabric and, and a, a brushed inner fabric, just like what we see here on the Sabre. So it's important to understand the performance of those breathable membranes. And I really wish and implore manufacturers to at least publish that statistic and also publish the fabrics that they're using. Credit to Arcteryx, they do publish all of the face fabrics. Now they don't always specify where. So for example, on the Rush jacket, I said that it essentially uses the same um, face fabric as the Sabre, but it does list too, a N80 and an N100. And I suspect that it, the N100 is being used up on the shoulders and the top arms in those sort of high wear environments for backpacks. But if I was to issue a plea to the industry, it would be, publish the uh, face fabrics on your garments, publish the waterproof breathable membrane ratings, and publish the um, weight or type of backing fabric. 
Now, a little pro tip, pardon the pun, you might be seeing some garments in the Arcteryx lineup that are listed as Gore-Tex and Gore-Tex Pro. Now, I'm not an expert at this, and the Gore-Tex Pro fabric has only come into existence fairly recently after I've left working in the outdoor uh, equipment industry. So, as I understand it, the only difference is that the Gore-Tex Pro is using um, a printed style backer similar to a 2.5 layer system. And uh, because that's so minimal, it, uh, it can perform much better than say a, a standard face or in this case, a fleece backer. So for these sabers, you're not going to see that Gore-Tex Pro rating uh, because it uses that brush fleece backer, but it could, and I think possibly does use the exact same actual waterproof breathable membrane. So that's my pro tip. So the importance of these ratings as they apply to mountain bikers directly relate to actual physical exertion. So if you're going out in a wet environment, obviously waterproof ratings are going to be really important, but arguably just as important, if not more important, are going to be the breathability ratings because mountain bike inherently can be and is a high output activity. So if you're wearing a waterproof breathable jacket and then you go out in something that maybe only has a five or 10,000 gram per meter squared breathability rating and you want to really push yourself and you're going to generate a lot of heat well what can end up happening is your output can exceed the ability of that garment to actually breathe it out and instead what you'll end up doing is forming condensation on the inside and that's bad because if you're trying to stay dry forming water on the inside of your waterproof breathable jacket is the exact opposite thing that you want. So you want to try to match the, um, the waterproof breathability rating to your desired level of output, or simply just aim for the highest breathability and the highest rating of waterproof uh, that you can. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about the Sabre pants. These are the bib versions which I absolutely love. I like a bib. Uh, I find that I tend to run a little bit cool. So I like the ability to have a little bit uh, higher protection from the wind and elements and to actually trap a little bit more heat. The bib has a nice little lanyard attachment on the inside and it is a gusseted bottom. So it will expand a little bit as you put larger volume items. There is a full waistband here, which for me is great because I film with a side pouch that uses a, um, a, a belt to attach. And we can see here that there are two little snaps that correspond to other Arcteryx jackets where you, you uh, can snap your actual powder skirt directly onto the pants themselves. On the left leg, we can see that there is a, call it a third zip here and it is a full open with no mesh interior. When I first got these pants, I was actually disappointed that they didn't have a mesh. However, somebody who knows a lot more than I do about this stuff had actually commented in one of their videos that uh, though the mesh is really nice for preventing spin drift from getting in, um, it does significantly impact the ability to dump excess heat. So this is actually the better of the two options. On the right hand side, we can see it's a longer zip with a snap on the top of it. And this is the side that you would use for access and egress of the pants. No need to have the redundancy on the one side, uh, on both sides, sorry. This is more than appropriate here. Both legs do have thigh pockets. This one on the right side has an internal sort of um, stretch fabric pocket that is the perfect size for a phone but there is no lander detachment like what you saw up here. On the left-hand side, we can see that there is a, just a simple large open space, but it does have a lander detachment. So I find this to be an interesting combination of features, but what I think that they're trying to do is put your phone in a, a, a different pocket that you would have or away from your actual transceiver in case there's any, um, you know, magnetic interference between the two devices. Both the jacket and the pants 
are Rico enabled. So that is a standard that's used, used predominantly more in Europe, but there is a passive non, uh, non-powered uh, reflector that's in the event of an avalanche. Uh, rescuers, if they have the appropriate equipment, can pass a uh, radio beam and if it reflects back from that embedded reflector, then um, they can detect that there are uh, burials. Down here, we can see that there is a really nice uh, abrasion resistant cuff, um, very durable. And a unique feature on the actual skirt itself that goes over the boot, there is a hole that allows you to pass your booster strap through. Let's see if I can show you there. And that booster strap can actually lock down your powder cuff to your boot so that in the event of a fall, it's not going to rip up and you're gonna get a bunch of snow in the leg. So I really like that. And this is where we can see we have our Rico reflector, which is right here. So I've gone ahead and put the pants on just to kind of give you an idea about fitment and height. Uh, for reference, I'm just shy of five foot nine or 172 centimeters. Uh, I have about a 29, 30 inch waist. These are the size small in the regular length and they fit absolutely perfect. You can see here the actual thickness through the thigh. I am wearing a thin pair of pants underneath here, but this would not be inconsistent with say a long base layer or even a pair of puffy pants for cold days. Now I am holding this avalanche transceiver in my hand for a reason. And that reason is kind of, I don't want to call it a criticism or a complaint because the way that I'm using my transceiver is not how the manufacturer recommends. They always want you to keep it in their designated protective case. A lot of people tend to keep it in the thigh pocket. I'm not a big fan of that, not only from having just that weight on the thigh, but I think if I'm going to fall, that's a really likely place that I'm going to um, hit. Whereas if it's on my chest or my core, if I'm falling in somewhat of a controlled manner, I can probably try to protect it or naturally, instinctually, you know, you're going to want to protect your core. Um, and thus, for the bib pant, I'm inclined to actually put it up here. And of course, there is this nice lanyard that you can clip it to. There we go. And everything tucks away nice and neat. You can see that the actual bottom of the gusting sort of popped out and it's great. Well, sort of. The problem is, is that there's no internal division in this pocket. And so, Naturally, you would like the transceiver to stand in like a vertical orientation and maybe even say off to one side or even if it is in the center. But what it naturally wants to do is fall and lay down. And because this pocket is gusseted, which is a good thing, it also means that there is room for that transceiver to fall quite low. And it's a bit of an awkward position. It's kind of right over the bottom of your sternum, the big upper part of your abdomen, and it just feels really kind of awkward. It doesn't feel, um, it, it almost presses on your body in a bit of a weird way. So I wish that the internal division with the stretch pocket down here on the thigh also existed up here so that I can take my transceiver, I can put it in a nice secure position and I can fill other items around it. That said, that's going to be my workaround moving in the future is just filling this pocket with additional items so that, that transceiver stays a bit more in a vertical or even off to one side type of orientation and uh, which is a lot more comfortable because you've got the support of your rib cage uh, underneath it. Uh, as opposed to just falling in a, a bit of a soft, awkward spot on the body. Now, turning our attention over to the jacket, it's pretty classic fare here. So there's two large breast pockets on either side. There is no internal uh, pocket or gusseting. Worth noting is they're actually not as big as you would think or maybe even hope that they would be. This seam line here is actually the top of the pocket, which is crazy because the top of the pocket is lower than the top of the actual zipper. So the pocket is shorter than the zipper is long. It's weird, but it's true. That exists on both sides. There's a single car and it's not the waterproof style zip. I actually quite like this rugged style zip. On the back, we can see that Arcteryx has done a nice gray font for the logo. We have a very basic back. Of course, a helmet compatible hood. Underneath both arms are pit zips. 
and as we can see here on the left arm there is a pass pocket that's also where the jacket rico reflector is located these are all very similar uh, features between the rush and the saber however on the saber it's not the most obvious but it is a soft brushed back inner and so as we were talking about at the beginning of the video this will inherently cut down on its breathability rating but as also mentioned it will make for a slightly warmer garment so trade-offs for me who tends to run a bit cold in the winter time then i think that this is going to be perfect fine for me and if I do start to overheat I can crack the zips or just simply reduce my physical output. On the inside we can see that there are two internal pockets. Of course the one on the left here has a pocket on a pocket but being that it's a mesh pocket on top of a mesh pocket I wouldn't put anything heavy in there um, but that would be a good spot if you had a couple of extra GoPro batteries that you wanted to keep close to your person so it could try to stay warm and not die on you. That said, I really wish that these pockets were a lot deeper than what they are. Not only is it small when it comes to carrying a spare goggle lens, but they're especially small if you're thinking about using the internal pockets for carrying your ski skins. A lot of people prefer to put the skins on the inside of their jacket when skiing down, so it keeps the glue a bit more pliable than stuffing it in the bag where it's going to be subject to the ambient freezing temperatures. But these are very small, and I'm going to illustrate this with my Promoka Free Pro 2.0s, which are arguably the thinnest, most packable skins out there. So here we have my Promoka Free Pro 2.0s. Yes, they do have a plastic backer on it, but they are also um, cut down to like a 181, and a lot of people ski 190. So I think this is still a realistic example of what you might have in your own closet. And you can see here for scale, it's already a tight fit. I can try to tuck these, tuck these in as best I can. Let's see here. There, hopefully about as good as I can do without actually wearing the jacket. It does fit, but not great. I think it would be uh, easier if they were just a bit taller and put a lot less stress on the actual pocket itself. Of course, powder skirt, and as mentioned earlier, we can see depicted in this tag, there is the corresponding snap lock system that allows the jacket to actually lock right on to the uh, Art Carrots compatible pants. So putting the jacket on now, just to illustrate its fitment. Once more, this is a size small jacket. One thing I really like about it is that it's a slimmer jacket, meaning that while you can layer underneath here, and there's certainly enough room to do so, it's not so uh, so um, so spacious that you're going to end up trapping cold air underneath. So it is a really nice fit. Of course, there are these really nice molded um wrist straps here easy to adjust but this more or less wraps up our tour here of this jacket and again i understand that this is a mountain bike channel so i hope that a lot of the things that i've talked about today you can see their applicability in the mountain bike space the uh, construction face fabrics liner fabrics waterproof breathable ratings and general fitment as well. Like I said, um, this is still absolutely a mountain bike channel and I look forward to bringing you more dedicated mountain bike videos in the future. But if you are uh, a subscriber, uh, please let me know in the comments down below whether or not you would like to see more ski related content, if this is something that you might already be doing in the winter, or if you would like to see it, but maybe on its own channel. So. Thank you all very much for uh, tuning in this week. I sincerely appreciate it. If again, you came here just for review of this jacket for ski touring, but you happen to like mountain biking or camping or rooftop tenting or rooftop tenting in mountain bike and camping and all in one, please consider subscribing and sticking around because that's absolutely where the future of this channel is going. So thank you to all for watching. You take care and bye for now.
Ooh, it's cool. 